Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather with us on this Monday, the 29th of April. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information around Alaska. You can do that very easily by calling the Alaska Weather Information Line, 1-800-472-0391, or find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska. Another way on your mobile device, mobile.weather.gov is a mobile-friendly website that will give you your national weather forecast. You can bookmark that and add that uh, to your list there on your homepage. It is low bandwidth, uh, pretty fast, and again, uh, will serve any part of Alaska there. Just touch in your village name, and uh, it should work fairly well. If you can't find what you're looking for, whether it's an aviation forecast, a river breakup forecast, or anything else, let me know. I'm pleased to serve you any way I possibly can. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is how you find me. A high wind warning will continue across some of the Bering Strait communities until about 6 o'clock tonight. So this should be wrapping up and improving already as you're watching our show tonight. Uh, conditions will remain breezy through the overnight hours and those southerly winds should improve. A very broad area of low pressure is moving eastward and kind of constricting the flow across the St. Lawrence Island region as well as the western end of the Seward Peninsula. So a lot of wind is moving through this region right now. But that should get better as we go through the rest of the night. So still gusty, still breezy, but as far as those peak level winds go, conditions should be calming down as we uh, get into the evening and overnight hours there. Uh, maybe not completely calm, but certainly not as windy as it has been. As we look at the breakup map for Monday, it should remind you that we are expecting another breakup update by Thursday. Uh, for new conditions there across the region. Uh, Crane Johnson or uh, one of the other hydrologists from the River Forecast Center will be joining us there for an update as we've been giving you for the last three weeks now on Thursdays. In the meantime, we do have some breakup news. Uh, senior hydrologist in charge, uh, Scott Lindsay, has deployed to Eagle to check out conditions there uh, in the Upper Yukon. And uh, he should have some more information for us as of tomorrow, but he is heading toward Eagle. And uh, Selena Van Broecklin is uh, moving down toward Bethel now as she is going to check out conditions there on the lower and middle Kuskokwim Valley there. So we expect some more information from her uh, later today and on into tomorrow. So we'll be passing that on as soon as we get it. In the meantime, you can see that some parts of the Yukon have been uh, opening up just a little bit. The light shade of blue there indicates some open conditions there as well as areas in the middle of the valley there along the Tanana. You can see a lot of changes, a lot of dark blue there in the upper Tanana especially. And then of course across the uh, Kuskokwim Valley is uh, certainly a lot of uh, uh, partially open there. We do have new news from ANIAC though that conditions pretty much have mushed out there. So good news and no major threats to ANIAC at this time because of that news that uh, again conditions have mushed out in the Cusco along ANIAC. But we will providing uh, will have more information uh, certainly in the next couple days as we go forward because River Watch has started and we know that's a big deal to you if you live along the river. So make sure you check in on the latest information here. And as you have information, please share that with us so that we can share that more broadly with more folks around southwest Alaska that need your river reports. In the meantime, conditions are pretty dry. Across the interior, in fact, relative humidities dropped around the Tanana Valley uh, and, and points eastward to about 10% or so today. That is very, very Kindle dry kind of stuff. Uh, not good news for fire danger, so that looks to be climbing now as we've been moving into a drier pattern, at least as of late. In southwest, you can see drier conditions here, a higher fire danger around the Kuskokwim Valley and into parts of uh, the Bristol Bay region. And then hit and miss across the Sitna Valley, the western Kenai. We did have a fire uh, pop up. Uh, quickly around Anilchik over the weekend. That was snuffed out just as quickly thanks to fast-acting fast crews there on the Kenai Peninsula Borough. So uh, congratulations on the fast attack there and success. And across the eastern Alaska range, uh, again, drier conditions on either side of the higher train. Southeast still doing okay right now. North Slope as well as the West Coast looking uh, pretty nominal at this point. Now, as we look at the rest of Alaska, you can see the satellite picture showing that deep low pressure system moving north of the western chain. And a very definitive 
line of clouds here. That is formed along and ahead of a frontal boundary moving eastward. All ahead of that, a lot of wind moving through the St. Lawrence Island and Bering Strait communities there. Uh, thus, the high wind warning that was in effect earlier today and uh, is expected to improve as conditions go. We have had low pressure here across the Gulf of Alaska. That's been pushing warm and wet air northward toward the Kenai Peninsula, Prince William Sound, and occasionally making it into the anchorage of the Matanuska and Susitna Valley region with a little bit of light rain. Not a whole lot to write home about, but certainly enough uh, to get your attention there, especially in Settle the Dust, we hope. Across southeast, you can see a generally dry day there, a little bit of an onshore flow for most communities, helping to keep things just a little bit cooler there. One exception would be Haines. The wind coming out of uh, Haines has been blowing offshore, and with that, you got a little bit of the glacial dust moving through the region there. It uh, kept temperatures down for an hour or so on diminished visibility in the region. You probably saw that. Uh, but temperatures jumped into the 60s, uh, certainly not what we saw across most other communities in southeast thanks to the onshore flow you were receiving there. In the middle Tanana Valley, conditions have been fairly dry and again uh, dry enough to warrant some fire weather concerns there. We'll keep watch on that. And across the north slope, you can see plenty of cloud cover moving through. All in all, though, really not a whole lot falling from it at this point with high pressure sitting very close to Arctic Village at around 1,000. 36 millibars. A trough of low pressure sits north of the Alaska Range. We have another surge of warmer and wetter air moving towards south central and southwest. Uh, pretty beefy low out here across the western bearing, 974 millibars there, and a front that's moving east uh, toward the west coast of Alaska, and that's what's bringing us a lot of wind through the Bering Strait communities at this hour. High pressure across the eastern interior will still remain intact as we head through tonight. It may uh, tag along for the ride a little bit later tonight and into tomorrow, but the main feature is really going to be here across the Gulf at about 1,033 millibars. The trough of low pressure north of the Alaska Range will stay put, and that's going to help draw more air northward as we go into the next day and a half to two days there, but not a whole lot of precipitation is going to make it into the interior. The main focus for wet weather will be around Kodiak Island, the Cook Inlet region, Prince William Sound, the Kenai Peninsula, and westward toward St. Paul and St. George. North of Nunavak Island, we'll probably see that mixing in with a little bit of rain and snow. The low is down to 978 millibars, and that's enough to keep some gales going across parts of the Bering Strait, and, or Bering Sea, I should say. And then as we head into your Tuesday, you'll notice the frontal boundary itself falls apart. But the flow is still with us, and that means that general southerly wind will continue, though maybe not as strong across south and west. It will still be there and still pulling in that warm and wet air across a large part of the Kuskokwim and the Yukon Valleys in the Norton Sound and even Nome and uh, parts of the Seward Peninsula itself. High pressure sits up north around the Arctic coast at 1,030 millibars. That should keep a lot of the eastern two-thirds or so of Alaska pretty dry and really limit the amount of cloud cover we see. You'll see high clouds passing through, but by and large, the lower precipitation-making clouds probably won't stand much of a chance. We'll also see a northerly wind across southeast. That's a drier wind for you. Expect a little more sunshine and warmer weather again until those sea breezes kick in. High pressure sitting across the Gulf at 1,032 millibars tomorrow. Not a big change as we head into Wednesday. You'll notice low pressures crept up now on the YK Delta for your midweek, 1,012 millibars there. A gentle southerly wind compared to the stronger push of wind we had earlier in the week. Drier conditions for the eastern half and southeast. A little bit of rain and snow north and west of Nunavak Island into St. Lawrence Island and then kind of a ragged area of low pressure out in the west. Most areas in the eastern half of Alaska will be staying dry, including the Panhandle. Overnight low temperatures in the upper 30s for southeast, 30s and 40s for south central, close to freezing around southwest. The interior looking at temps close to freezing as well. Teens and 20s up north, uh, Utkiavik around 22, and Kotzebue 33. McCoryuk, 29, and 32 around Gamble and Savunga. High temperatures tomorrow in the interior will blossom into the lower to mid-60s. Fairbanks looking at 66, low 30s for the North Slope, 40s and 50s for South Central, Southeast back in the 50s and 60s. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And on to aviation weather now, a little bit of a different look than what we saw over the weekend. Uh, IFR conditions will be fairly widespread across the north and western Gulf of Alaska. For southeast, generally VFR conditions on the inside passage and along the outer coast, but just offshore a little bit further out, you'll run into 
mixed areas of NVFR and IFR conditions. On the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range, you'll at least see marginal conditions. IFR, those expected to move across the lower Kobuk and Noatak valleys into Kotzebue Sound and also along the north slope and widespread across the north and western parts of the Bering, including St. Lawrence Island and over Nunavak Island. As we go into Tuesday afternoon, watch for IFR conditions to be widespread across the Gulf. Southeast still getting off clean with VFR conditions through the afternoon there and really for most of the middle and upper Tanana Valley, the upper Yukon, all the way out through the Seward Peninsula and Looks like Noah might just sneak away with visual flight rule through most of your Tuesday afternoon, but through the Bering Strait community, St. Lawrence Island, Nunavak Island, and really most of the Alaska Peninsula along the coastline anyway, IFR conditions should be expected. Watch for marginal conditions across most of Southwest, and again, uh, IFR and MVFR for many areas around the North Slope. So we get into Wednesday morning, you can see how the IFR is just kind of crushing in on more parts of Alaska. Across the upper Yukon Valley, the Tanana Valley, things still look pretty good there. Southeast still looking like a VFR kind of morning there for your Wednesday, but IFR all the way around the Gulf through Kodiak Island, all the way out to Sand Point, most of the Alaska Peninsula, up the West Coast, through the Bering Strait, and once again for the North Slope, marginal levels for the Brooks Range and most of southwestern Alaska. A little bit of a VFR hole around South Central in the northern parts of the Kenai Peninsula in Matsu. That starts to fill in by Wednesday afternoon. Southeast still looking pretty good. Most of the central and eastern interior in the Copper River Valley looking pretty good. But IFR, widespread for the North Slope, a lot of the West Coast, and really most of the Bering, including St. Paul, St. George, and up into uh, western ends of Norton Sound and now Nome into IFR and marginal conditions through the afternoon. Here's your pass conditions now. Anaktubik and Attigan Pass, we expect to see at least marginal levels throughout your day there. As we get into Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, probably looking MVFR through most of your Tuesday. Rainy Pass, the same. Marginal levels there will continue throughout the day, and the same goes for Windy Pass. Isabel Pass probably winds up okay. VFR expected most of the day, and we'll see that trend extend eastward into Mentasta Pass and southward into Tanita Pass. Portage likely leans on marginal levels most of the day. Now, on the west side, things will be okay, but if you're coming in from Prince William Sound side, that'll be marginal. Uh, Chilkoot and White Pass also expected to be VFR, and you might get a two-day sail out of that through your Wednesday. Freezing levels show that there are certainly some warmer pockets around the region, but we do have a couple areas of cooler weather lingering across South Central into the Copper River Valley. Uh, levels there below six to even 4,000 feet at times. Southeast looking at levels between six and 8,000 feet. Across the West Coast between at least six, maybe four as you work your way northward. Uh, most areas, they're not quite making it to 8,000 foot levels and 6,000 foot freezing levels across the North Slope. So a lot of uh, cool and warm weather uh, all mixing up right across a large part of Alaska. Icing potential remains pretty high up there as far as uh, to get into that good uh, zone of um, icing potential, generally above 10,000 feet for most of West and Southwestern Alaska and around uh, Adak and Atka above 7,000 feet, a little bit cooler out in the west, but most of southeast, the interior, and the north slope don't have any significant icing concerns at this point. And here's why we have such kind of a hodgepodge with that warm and cold air. We have low pressure out to the west in the Bering and also across the Yukon and uh, British Columbia with a ridge of high pressure extending up over the Gulf and up over the North Slope. That is driving winds in from the Pacific and taking a hard bend northward up the West Coast through the Bering Strait. Those wind speeds around 70 to 100 knots. And across the West Coast, 90 to 60 to 90 knots across the uh, West Coast of the uh, lower 48 and uh, Canada. And a pretty deep southerly draw coming off of the Gulf moving up into the interior. At 9,000 feet, high pressure is clearly seen here with a ridge driving those southerly winds up the west coast, 30 to 50 knots at times. Northwesterly is coming down the Alcan border into southeast, 20 to 30, and generally light winds across south central. At 3,000 feet, exactly the same picture going on here, 20 to 35 knot winds across the west coast, more of a west and southwesterly pull across the chain, and northerly is coming down the Alcan and into southeast, about 10 to 20 knots there with high pressure over the Gulf. So turbulence is really going to be focused on the west coast at least for the next 24 to 36 hours from Kotzebue and Shishmarif all the way down through Norton Sound, southwest, especially the Capes, Bristol Bay, and the Alaska Peninsula. Southeast, you're looking at some chop below 4,000 feet. Watch for some chop around the central and western chain, some of that reaching considerable moderate west of Adak, and again, a chance for some considerable uh, moderate turbulence around St. Lawrence Island as well. <laughs> It's the rhythm of our everyday life. 
We're more dependent on satellite and communication systems than at any other time in history. Disruptions can affect our economy and even our safety. To prepare for the effects of such events and minimize impacts, we need to look outside our atmosphere, some 93 million miles away, at a star we call the Sun. It's our main energy source. It warms the Earth and grows our food. While the sun and the space between may seem pleasant from our perspective, it's anything but peaceful. At its surface exists a chaotic state of eruptions and radiation. And unlike Vegas, what happens at the sun doesn't stay at the sun. Space weather is essentially emissions from the sun, uh, radiation, magnetic field that erupts from the solar surface, pumped out into space, sometimes right towards Earth. When it impacts the Earth, it impacts our technology. That's what we call space weather. These solar events and their effects at Earth can disrupt systems we take for granted. From causing blackouts to the power grid, to delaying offshore drilling operations due to inaccurate GPS data. Interference with communication systems can force air traffic to reroute and impact rescue response and coordination. Outside our atmosphere, solar radiation can harm astronauts and the systems they depend on. The good news is that these eruptions can be detected early. Forecasters at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado, have their eyes on the sun at all times. The Space Weather Prediction Center is part of the National Weather Service and is very much like a normal weather forecast office. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're looking at data, we're looking at imagery, we're looking at model outputs. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches of imminent activity to our customers so they can take action. In many ways, forecasting space weather is a lot like forecasting hurricanes. Those who rely on space weather forecasts, like electric power grid managers, are informed early on and can begin taking protective action. When we see an eruption on the sun, space weather forecasters will issue a watch. And this is much like a hurricane watch. When a hurricane sits offshore of Miami, for example, perhaps 48 hours out, we too can see way in advance that something may be coming towards the Earth. As the storm moves toward us, it hits a monitoring spacecraft orbiting a million miles away from Earth. It's kind of our, our buoy sitting out there offshore and that hurricane about 30, 45 minutes before it makes landfall, we'll get the measurements from the buoy. That's what the spacecraft does for us. That big eruption that left the sun hits the spacecraft. Now we've got the measurements of exactly what's going to impact us here on Earth. And we issue the warnings to give the power grid a heads up that the storm is now imminent. An interesting element to this whole process is that when the forecasters issue the alert, the power grid receives the alert, takes the necessary actions to protect the grid, the average citizen never knows anything ever happened. The number of customers who rely on space weather information continues to grow. As our reliance on technology increases, so will our need for constant monitoring of the sun. Space weather affects technologies. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches to our customers so they can take action.
GPS has changed society. Most people don't realize how remarkable and how many different applications there are. The GPS has become an integral part, not just of our daily lives as far as cell phones and guidance for our cars and mapping, but the whole uh, system in agriculture is really relying heavily on high accuracy GPS. So they're using GPS to plant those seeds with centimeter accuracy. And then they can come behind it and, and irrigate and fertilize right where that seed is with that one centimeter accuracy. The GPS creates a line for the operator that he can steer along. Or you go to another level and the operator doesn't steer anymore and the tractor has an automatic steering system on it, much like a cruise control on a car, except for when I push the button, it doesn't drive a set speed. When I push a button, it stays on a predefined line. You don't even need lights. You can do it at nighttime. You program your GPS and it's driving that tractor for you. So it's, uh, it's huge and it's changing the way that the farmers farm the fields. Six or seven days out. There's an interest in GPS applications from space weather side because when the sun is erupted, it causes GPS to falter and in some cases it doesn't work at all. Productivity may suffer to a certain degree in that there's no way that I as a human being can steer as good eight hours a day as a, a GPS system is going to do. It's going to be the same all day long. Some of the other application technologies, those are going to be gone. We're not going to have the ability to do good section control on sprayers and planters and fertilizer applicators without GPS. We see a huge growing customer base in so many different industries, so many different sectors now relying on GPS and high precision GPS, all big customers for us. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And back with your sea ice update for this Monday. Uh, looks like higher concentration ice still sitting around the Chukchi coast through the Bering Strait and on the north side of St. Lawrence Island and wrapping down toward the Yukon Delta coastline. You'll notice a lot of uh, changes there in the Norton Sound region. And with strong southerly winds, we do expect to see some of this higher concentration ice Moving northward once again, uh, the other side of that is it is warming up as that south wind comes in, but later in the week, probably Wednesday into Thursday, we are going to see some cooler air return to the region and perhaps cold enough and slow enough that there could be some new ice forming in the region. So something to look forward to later on in the week. For the very latest information and outlook, head to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice anytime. Here's a look at southeast wind forecast now for northwesterly winds. We go to the Lynn Canal, 10 knots and 2 foot seas there. You can see winds coming up to about 10 to 15 knots heading southward into the Clarence Strait, 2 to 3 foot seas there. Northwesterlies across the outer coast as well, 20 knots with 6 to about 7 foot seas. The further south you go, a little bit more of a westerly flow coming into Yakutat from Prince William Sound. For Wednesday, you can see some of that actually makes its way toward Yakutat and Icy Cape. 20 to 25 knots there with 7 to 8 foot seas. Northwesterlies pick up across the outer coast to 25 knots with 8 to 9 foot seas by Wednesday. Light winds continue on the inside. Uh, north and northwesterlies a little bit stronger, 15 knots down through Stevens Passage and Clarence Strait with 3 foot seas by the midweek. For South Central and Prince William Sound, northeasterly is at 15 knots with a 2-foot sea, 3 to as high as 9-foot seas coming down Cook Inlet. The higher seas, of course, down around the Barren Islands at 25 to 30 knot winds coming in from the east and southeast for Tuesday. For Wednesday, a lot of that diminishes there. We'll still hold on to some stronger winds outside of Hitchinbrook entrance and uh, again extending eastward toward southeastern Alaska. But generally speaking, 10 knots in most areas, maybe 15 outside of Resurrection Bay and about two to three foot seas in most of our bays and our passes. As we look at Tuesday in southwest, 25 knots with an easterly flow in Bristol Bay, five foot seas there, six foot seas maybe a little bit further down the coast, 20 to 25 knots on the Bering Sea coast side, 20 to 25 
Around the Pacific Coast waters inside of Shelikov Strait, an easterly flow 20 knots and 5 foot seas there. That diminishes again on Wednesday as high pressure takes command. Southerly flow coming into Kodiak Island, southeasterlies in Bristol Bay, and northerly winds coming into the Alaska Peninsula with a 6 foot sea, 9 foot seas on the other side. For the Aleutians, 15 to 25 knots, most areas way out west will get a little bit more of a southwesterly flow, stronger at 30 knots with a 14 foot sea elsewhere, 7 to about 10 foot seas on the Bering Sea coast side, and 12 to 15 foot seas on the Pacific coast side for your Tuesday. Winds also diminish on Wednesday. You're looking for generally light winds around the eastern chain, 10 to 15, 7 to 8 foot seas most areas, and a south and southwesterly flow the further west you go. 15 to 20 knots there with 7 to 8 foot seas expected for your Wednesday from uh, Atka all the way out toward Kiska and Shemya. As we look at the west coast, an east and southeasterly flow will be the predominant pattern. Uh, look for the stronger easterly winds around the Norton Sound, 20 to 25 knots with a 4 to 5 foot sea there. Southeasterly is a little bit stronger still around Macquarie, Nunavak Island, and out toward St. Matthew with a 7 to 14 foot sea. Northwesterly is a little bit on the light side there, but sea is higher at 10 feet around St. Paul and St. George. And southeasterly is also blowing through the Kuskokwim Delta with a 7 foot sea there. Uh, look for northwesterlies around Nunavak Island. Southerlies around St. Matthew, 20 knots with a 10 foot sea. And northerlies still going around St. Paul and St. George with an onshore flow coming into Amonic and uh, Hooper Bay at 15 knots with a 3 foot sea on Wednesday. For the north slope, offshore winds from the south and west, 10 to 15 knots there over the ice, and south and easterly winds blowing uh, offshore about 15 to 20 knots across the Chukchi coast. It looks like that trend will continue as we get into Wednesday. A little bit more of a north and easterly flow over the Beaufort, east uh, and southeast winds across the Chukchi, 15 to 20 there as we get into your Wednesday and look for an onshore flow around St. Lawrence Island and into Norton Sound once again, 15 knots and 3 foot seas over the ice. Recapping tonight's weather, looks like pretty quiet and generally clear conditions for most of southeast and the eastern interior. In fact, very dry weather has the attention of fire weather uh, officials there, so be very uh, careful with fire across the eastern interior right now as relative humidities stay very low. Low pressure is across the Bering Sea at 978 millibars. It's pushing a front toward western Alaska. It's been drawing up some strong winds. That should diminish around the St. Lawrence Island and Bering Strait communities tonight, but it does have warm and wet air with it, and those winds will diminish. It does look like we'll keep a chance for some light rain across parts of west and southwestern Alaska tonight over south central and Kodiak Island, southeast, the interior, and the north slope stay pretty dry as we head into Wednesday. Low pressure does come ashore as we get into Wednesday afternoon for southwest. Uh, the flow is a lot more uh, weak and diminished as we have been looking at for the last couple days. That should improve. There's enough cold air there. We could see some mixed rain and snow showers north of Nunavak Island towards St. Lawrence Island by midweek. High pressure holds still across the east. Thanks for watching. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.